Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wish I could say it's nice to see you, but I still can't see all of you. So I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks that will change. Maybe during even the testing period, I plan on being on campus and seeing all of you. So I appreciate you joining us this morning. We're, our format's going to be a little different today. Uh, we are actually going to uh, have some of the, my staff and my administrators to talk with you about how we're going to move forward in some of the ways in their areas. I thought it was important that you hear from them. The questions that we have received, they either will answer them directly or they will be part of their presentation. So as we move forward, again, if you have questions, please make sure you email them after the meeting to uh, Jen's uh, emails and uh, that way then we can answer them at the next meeting. We'll talk about the next meeting before we leave this uh, session, but uh, I wanted to start off this morning with some great news. We have two people on our group today that it's their birthdays, so I want to make sure that we say a big happy birthday to Rob Moyers and to Christina Dalton. We really appreciate all the work they've done but it's their special day and they're here with us. So we appreciate them doing that on their birthday. Uh, the other news is, is that the target is still moving. So, so all the things you're gonna to hear today are as of today. I do want you to know that as we move down this road, you're gonna see things that are a little different on our campus than they are on how they do them on the Morgantown campus or the Potomac State campus. And, uh, you know, we may have different makeups of things as they do on those three campuses. So keep in mind that as we move along, we are going to do the things that we think are best for tech. And with the consultation of Morgantown and the help that we could have never done without with them, uh, we hope to make this a great year. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and introduce the first person that's going to talk to us today. And he's going to talk to us about facilities and some of the things you should expect when you get back on campus. 
So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce the birthday boy, Rob Moyers. Thank you, Carolyn. And yes, I'm going to celebrate because this is my last year in the 40s. So I've got one more and then starts going downhill. Well, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you guys today. We did receive some questions. Um, I'd like to follow up with some of those as I speak through some of the topics. Um, but Jen, if you would go ahead and slide to the next one. Um, so far, uh, as many of you know on campus, we've had some uh, folks off on furlough. Um, so we were at a really skeleton crew for the last two months or three months or so. Um, but during that time, we were able to go through all of the residence rooms in Hogan and University. We had cleaned and sanitized them. We have an electrostatic machine that we use to help sanitize all of the rooms. We've prepped them and they are ready for use um, with students for students coming back in the fall for our athletes and RAs who are coming back a little early, and then hopefully the rest of our students when they arrive. Um, we were able to do that with the crew that we had on campus, along with continuing to do some work on the ISB building, the Interdisciplinary Science Building that's downtown. That's where our focus have been over the last couple of months. And uh, as of Sunday and Monday of this week coming up, we will return the rest of our facilities team so we are excited to get back to full strength and able to get through the rest of the buildings um, and, and clean those, both the classrooms, the labs, bathrooms, hallways, and we will be cleaning and sanitizing all of those spaces too over the next month or next three weeks really um, and having those spaces ready for you guys when you arrive. In addition, um, not only purchasing cleaning equipment for facilities, but we are ordering um, PPE items for the whole campus. Uh, some of things we've been receiving emails from the deans and chairs in regards to what they might need for their classrooms or their laboratories. Uh, part of this was because we're coordinating with Morgantown and they're buying bulk orders of this stuff in the hundreds and thousands of different sizes and styles. And it's just easy to keep track of. It's easy to report when we're looking to get refunded back from the COVID funds. Um, so if there are things moving forward in the future, please work through your Dean or department head to email me with specific needs that you might have. I know there's a lot of things that are still changing on what we're using in regards to gloves and masks and visors, but uh, we're happy to uh, oblige and uh, order anything that we can um, and see if we can get refunded through the COVID account. So, Jen? So cleaning, uh, as we mentioned, uh, what we're going to be doing in the fall is our campus public areas will be cleaned prior to the classes starting. So really that'll be happening during our night crew. So all of our classrooms, labs, hallways, bathrooms, everything's gonna get a nice cleaning at night. Then during the semester, what's gonna happen is we're going to assign a facilities person to each building. Um, now it may be a current custodian or maybe a maintenance person. But the goal there is that they're gonna be assigned to that building. They're gonna be cleaning the bathrooms at least once a day. Hopefully we can get there in more frequently. They're going to try and get into the classrooms between sessions and do a wipe down or sanitize those, some of the tables and chairs. Obviously the goal there is trying to get in with the, within those 15 minutes of class changes, but we're gonna do our best to try and hit those at least once during the day also. Then we're also gonna have all of the key touch points around uh, the building uh, addressed as frequently as we can. As we're walking by, we wanna get the door handles to uh, the entrances and exits. We wanna hit the elevator buttons. We wanna hit hand railings. We're gonna try and sanitize and wipe those down as frequently as we can. Please notice that when you're on campus, you may touch a railing that might be wet from us cleaning it. And there may be areas on campus that you'll see a light haze, maybe over a chair or a tabletop, and that might be part of the electrostatic cleaning. Um, it's not gonna be dirty, but uh, it is sometimes you get a haze on some of the different materials and types of materials that we have on campus. So please be aware, um, if you have questions or concerns, you can always email me and we'll try and uh, respond to you. And if uh, if you have any other needs that need specialized cleaning, please let us know. Okay. 
you will see signage around campus. Um, I'm going to try my best uh, to minimize the overload of signage everywhere. Um, but here's a couple of different samples that you might see on campus. Um, we'll have some on the doors that says before entering, please make sure you have your mask, you know, wash your hands frequently um, and maintain your six foot distance. We'll have other signs just reminding folks. And then we'll have arrows around different parts of the campus, either if you're standing in a queuing line waiting for a service or walking down the hallways where we want to, you know, make sure that you stay to the right or stay to the left of the hallway. So again, you'll see a lot of signage on campus this fall, um, but we hope to try and minimize the overload of signage so you don't, you know, look all over the place and not know where to focus your attention. So we'll do our best. I mentioned the PPE. Um, working with the Morgantown campus, um, I'm pleased to announce that we've received some of the packages already. These are our return to campus bags. Now our students and staff members, they will have the uh, washable WVU mask or gator. You'll get your choice when you do your testing. You'll have a WVU tech mask that's washable, three disposable uh, masks, uh, antibiotic, uh, hand sanitizers, we'll have some uh, wipes, and then uh, a touch tool that will allow you to push the elevator buttons or lights or whatever you might need without actually using your fingers. So all of these items are gonna be given to faculty, staff, and students, but the faculty will receive a different bag that will have hand, uh, will have whiteboard eraser cleaner, their own whiteboards, and then we have a box of red, green and black markers that will also be given to the faculty. Um, and when you run out or something happens, you let us know and we will drop off another box or cleaning chemicals to your department head or admin person and you can pick it up from them or possibly from us in facilities. But uh, so we'll have two different types of bags. Um, the other thing the faculty will have is they will have a face shield so that they can use when they're instructing uh, in their classrooms and or their laboratories which will be a little bit different than just the face mask. Okay. Continuing on, um, we are gonna have a contain container of cleaning wipes and it will look something like this. Each one of these um, will be in every office, um, in the residence hall bathrooms within the suites and at the instructor stations in the classrooms and labs. So if they wanna wipe off their uh, lectern or the tabletop, they, you're able to do that. We are gonna have hand sanitizers, either the electric or the pump style in every classroom and lab. And we're gonna have them in many hallways, near elevators, near front doors. So you'll have uh, an opportunity to use your hand sanitizers frequently. Um, some face shields will be provided um, in some of the laboratory situations. Please work with your department head, your dean and the provost to determine which labs are um, appropriate to have the face shields and we will make that uh, accommodation. And I have to say, no matter what we provide, please frequently wash your hands coming to and from doing activities. Um, washing your hands is still going to be our best bet for uh, trying to bring down the uh, transmission of this disease. Other PPE that we have for classrooms and labs um, we are reducing the seating capacities by 50%. So what was a classroom of 40 is now a classroom of 20. Um, in the front of the room by the lecter, lectern and instructor's table, we will have a six by six plexiglass mobile, it's on wheels, mobile uh, plexiglass. Now it is mobile, it's not very maneuverable, but it can be moved um, in the front of the room if needed. I mentioned the uh, instructor's table will have the wipes and then there will also be hand sanitizers in each and every classroom. Please note that we've ordered them, uh, but uh, we're still waiting on a couple of those to come in to get installed. One way or another, um, we will have some sort of hand sanitizers in the room, even if they're a temporary small pump, um, but we will have something ready for the start of classes. I wanted to note, uh, spend a second on events on campus. 
Um, as of right now, um, because of the reduction in capacities in our classrooms, we're going to need to utilize the two auditoriums that we have in Carter Hall and at uh, 410 Neville in the Administration and Extension Building. So events on campus as of right now, we've placed a hold on booking any events on campus until after uh, the end of August. This will give us a chance to schedule, make sure all the classes are scheduled. We have rooms assigned in case we have to do some flip-flopping. Um, we just didn't feel like we could open up events at this point in time. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had the priorities to the academic side. We will be sending out a notice as soon as we open up uh, the requests for uh, receiving requests for events. So you will see an email from us from facilities when we're ready to uh, allow uh, events to start getting booked again. And we may have some other rules and regulations in regards to what we can and cannot do within spaces. Parking permits, um, if you've listened to the Morgantown conversation, it was mentioned uh, in regards to um, if you are full-time stay, uh, stay at home, work from home. Um, we are in the process right now of working with them and understanding their process and what we can do. Um, we will be emailing um, out our new process and update, and we'll also be posting it to the website that will identify what we can and will be able to do as far as parking permits um, and or returning and coming off of uh, direct payroll. Lastly, in classroom setups, I'd mentioned that we are reducing the number of chairs in the classrooms and labs, and I'm creating a, 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 a floor plan for every classroom that we have, and I have a sample of that. So this is uh, the Innovation Building, room 313. What once had 32 seats now has 16 seats. And uh, you can see that we've eliminated every other chair. We will be removing them from the room and taking them to a storage facility. Um, this will be a, a paper document that's laminated. It's on the instructor's desk um, so that they will have that. And then we will also be uh, emailing all of the floor plans to the instructors, faculty, and uh, deans so that they can pull out their exact classes and courses that they have so that they can see what their room looks like, see the seating layout. And I think sometime during the semester, they're asking for names to be placed on the, uh, uh, each seat so that we can do some tracing later on. But I believe Joan will be going over that uh, in a few minutes. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Provost Neff. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all are doing well at this time, um, washing your hands and being safe and wearing masks and all that sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, Rob has done and his folks have done a great job of planning a lot of things for us to be able to come back and to do so safely. And I'll pick up essentially where he uh, left off, and that is with the uh, seating charts. The purpose of having seating charts in the classes in the fall is for contact tracing. And I know you've heard about that in various and sundry media have been talking about it. That if someone becomes ill and is diagnosed with COVID-19, then it's important for the health department to know who that person has been in contact with. So in the first part of the semester when the students come back, we want to give them at least a week and maybe into the second week in our classes to figure out where their appropriate seat is. So for example, on the seating chart that you see in front of you, you know, you may have students that come a little late the first day and they're sitting in, in the back in 16 or 15 and then they say, well, you know, I really need a seat near the front because I have some vision problems or something to that effect. So you need to work with the students, but once the second week of classes is underway and people are pretty comfortable in the seats that they have selected, so you're not assigning seats in the class. You may be trying to help a student who needs an accommodation get a seat in the best place for them, but you are recording then and saying to the students, okay, you've all kind of had a chance to select your seats and now I'm going to put your name on the number chart indicating which seat you are occupying in this course for the rest of the semester. 
And, there, and again, we're doing that for the purposes that if, if a student sitting in number one becomes ill and it's diagnosed with COVID, that we can let the health department know who that person's contacts in your class were and in the other classes as well. So it is for contact tracing. It's not to you know, control basically where they're sitting or, or why they're picking a particular seat. Um, so, and if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to, you know, to raise them with me or, or anyone else um, um, in the administration and we'll try to get some answers for you, but, but that is what it is actually for. Um, I also wanted to mention the academic calendar. I think there's been um, a number of concerns and questions about that. And just wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that you'll notice, and, and this is in the fall semester, of course, that we're focusing on, that there's no fall break. And the reasoning behind that is that the longer we let students go from the university, the less we control their environment. And so we are honoring two holidays in which the university is officially closed, and that's Labor Day and also Election Day. And we're trying not to let them spend a lot of time off of campus. Um, obviously, they can choose where they want to go and what they want to do and if they want to go home for the weekend or whatever. But we don't want them to have large breaks because that puts them at higher risk, perhaps. And it also puts others at higher risk once they come back to campus. So the, the, the fall semester looks a little bit different. And then, of course, when it comes time for Thanksgiving break, we are sending them home not to return until spring semester, again, as kind of a way of mitigating the contact. So the last week of classes will be done online. So all the faculty need to be aware of that. So there'll be review online instruction from November 30th through December 4th and then the final exam week, and we will be doing final exams remotely. We will not bring them back to campus until January. So again, as your faculty, as you're planning your syllabi and putting those types of things together, please take note of the fall semester. And then of course, the spring semester, you'll wanna look at that too, but things look a little different. And once again, these are things, this was approved by the Board of Governors. These are things that we're doing in order to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 as much as we can. Um, also, just to let you know, because we are asking faculty to um, do some things maybe in the classroom that you haven't done before in terms of perhaps you might have, if, you're, if you've gone through the HyFlex course that's on the TLC in Morgantown, the opportunity exists where you have your classes down to a smaller size in seat to Zoom with students who can't be present in the classroom because there aren't enough seats, but also to switch it up so that if I have a Tuesday and Thursday class, I might say to the half the class, you come on Tuesdays and the other half comes on Thursdays. And then the people who aren't in class have the opportunity to see the class, view the class live, and also it'll be recorded so on Zoom so that they can go back and review it. So that's part of the, the process that we're looking at. That's part of what we're trying to do as we reduce class room seats, we're also taking into consideration and we're going to be putting cameras in classrooms where we need to do that. We have opportunities for Zooming. Um, we know that this is, this is not something that you're necessarily accustomed to or not the way you might like to teach, but this is the way we're going to have to teach for the fall semester until we obviously go online, as I mentioned at the, at the end there. So we will have help sessions when the faculty are back on contract and before classes start, we're going to schedule some help sessions for faculty so that if you're not comfortable necessarily with some of the equipment, some of the technology, and I'm, I'm going to work with Mike Webb and IT and several other people to put together some sessions where we will help you understand the equipment better, help you understand the technology better, walk you through some things. And again, you know, accessibility to the help desk and being able to call someone if you're having problems. I know, for example, that um, when I taught in the spring semester, I needed someone to come and help me initially set up my laptop in the classroom and show me how things connected and how to get things on the screen. So if it's something you're not familiar with, don't hesitate to come to these sessions. And if you need individual help, someone from IT will be glad to work with you in your classroom to show you what you need to do. Um, and that would be better to think about that now rather than once classes have started. So we will help you in whatever way we can and facilitate it. Um, some questions that we had uh, submitted previously 
um, have to do with the use of face shields on the part of the faculty without mask in the classrooms. Ideally, we would like everyone to continue to wear their mask, but with the face shield, if the faculty member feels as though it would be better to remove the mask and teach with the face shield in place, and is in the front of the room behind the plexiglass, then do that. And part of the reason I think that's important to allow is because some students who may have a little bit of difficulty hearing, actually, even though they don't think they read lips, they're using the mouth movements of the faculty member to augment the, the auditory aspect of it. So people can do that if they feel that they're better able to communicate with the students or that the students better understand what they're saying if they have the face shield on, they can take the mask off. But if you start to interact with the students up close, the mask really should go back on. Um, so that's an answer to that question. And then another question came in about handouts, paper handouts in class. And I think, again, you have to be very careful about that. I would not ask the students to pass them out. But if you do have handouts and you you know, have made sure your hands are sanitized when you get them out of the printer or whatever. And it would be much better if you could actually put them in an email and send them to students so they would have them, you know, before class, if that's possible, or right after class. But handouts, you would want to hand them out to the students individually. And again, with masks on, face shields on, and do it that way. But I, I would suggest strongly that handouts be some, be not printed and handed out, but essentially put into a PDF form and sent to students or a Word document or something so that they have it also on their computer and then they can print it out if they want to. Um, and I think the other thing is just to remember, we are working very hard right now to get everything organized and ready. There will be things that when we come back to campus, we may have to change, we may have to fix, we may have to alter, but we will do that. So at this point in time, I think you all have to trust that we who are, who are working all summer on these things have taken every precaution we can possibly take to keep everyone safe. And then the rest of it is obviously up to all of you or all of us to maintain that wearing of the mask, sanitizing our hands, keeping our social distance. All of those things are very important as we go forward. So, and again, if you have questions or you have concerns, be sure to put them in the chat so that we can address them next time. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our interim um, Dean of Student Life, Emily Sands. Thank you, Joan. Um, I am very excited to welcome everybody back in the fall. I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about how some of the things with Student Life will be working. We have received some questions about dining services and how that is going to operate in the coming year. Um, we are going to be making some changes to make sure that we are doing the, providing safe service for all of our faculty, staff, and students that eat in our dining operations. So one of those changes will be that the Sodexo employees will serve all of the food. Um, there will be no more self-service for our food for this, for this upcoming semester. Um, students will actually be encouraged to use our grab and go options um, instead of dining in. And due to that, that we will actually be increasing our grab and go option availability. Um, where the salad bar normally is in the center of the bear's den will actually be replaced with pre-made salads and sandwiches. And if you still want that made to order salad, you can pop over to where the deli was and a Sedexo employee will make your salad for you there. Um, all of our cups will become single use. You cannot refill your current cup. You will need to get a clean cup every time. You also cannot refill any of your own personal water bottles or anything like that at, our, at the drink stations. Um, Sedexo is also going to be having a clean team um, that will be going through and sanitizing serving stations throughout the day um, to assist with the sanita sanitization of the areas. Um, we will be closing the bear's den twice a day for a deep clean um, and those will be between our meal periods. So the bear's den will be closed from 930 to 1030 and 2 to 430 to allow Sodexo employees to do that deep clean and that thorough sanitization of all of our high touch areas. The tech spot will be open during those times and your meal plan can be used there. Um, another piece that goes along with keeping everything clean and sanitized is 
The nozzles on our drink stations will be clean and sanitized every 30 minutes and the utensils will be changed out um, every 30 minutes as well. There was also going to be reduced seating capacity in the Bears Den, um, about 50%. There will, it will be some plexiglass shields and things like that to help protect everybody. And there's going to be multiple hand sanitizing stations available throughout the Bears Den and the tech spot. Um, it's, oh, it's always a good practice to make sure you're washing your hands and san or sanitizing your hands before you get your food and eat. Um, the next thing is move-in. We are doing a phased move-in this year. Um, I've been sending out email communications to students as they sign up for housing. Uh, move-in dates are available on our website and all of our students need to sign up for a move-in time by August 5th via the housing portal. Our move-in time slots are set at 90 minute increments. Um, this allows for, to make sure that we are maintaining safe limits of people gathering in our residence halls. When you arrive on campus, please go to your assigned residence hall and follow the signs to the check-in location for your building. Students that are moving into our residence halls can bring two people to help them move in. We will have carts and the normal stuff available for move-in like normal, but we will not have, be able to have the extra university faculty and staff that have normally assisted in the past. The other thing is that we need to make sure that everybody is following the universities and the governor's guidelines, and all individuals must wear masks during move-in. The other thing I want to talk to you guys about is, you know, make sure you are looking at what you're packing. You know, take, take a hard look at things as you're packing them. Do I really need this for the semester? Um, we want to make sure that you have what you need for a successful semester, but just, just consider how much stuff you're bringing with you. Um, and there will be some guidelines posted on, you know, how to safely pack, you know, make sure you're letting your boxes set so they can, um, the guidelines right now are to let the boxes set a little bit before you pack them. Um, and we also have on our website a list of suggested items that you should and should not bring. Um, please make sure you're referring to that. We want to make sure that you are having a very safe and successful year in our residence halls. There are also going to be a couple new guidelines and policies for our residence halls this year. Um, visitors, meaning non-WVU Tech students, to our residence halls, so parents, things like that, will only be allowed access to the public areas on the first floor. So if you're coming to get your son and daughter, you know, give them a call and just have them come outside and meet you. Um, the other thing is that we will not be allowing overnight guests in our residence halls this year. One of the other things that we've gotten some questions about is our student organization guidelines. Um, one of the big things that I want to emphasize is that group travel for events where you guys will be representing your organization and or WVU Tech, regardless of whether you use university funds or private funds, all travel is prohibited for the fall 2020 semester for social functions. That's for your safety as well as the safety of our Golden Bear family. We are also encouraging everybody to meet um, your student groups to meet online via Zoom or Google Meet for the duration of the semester. Um, we are also currently working on some po policies and procedures that and guidelines that will hopefully allow you guys to meet face to face um, after the end of August. Um, please make sure you're checking our student organization website and your email for those details. We are working on finalizing them. We do want to make sure that we are working with you guys as best as possible. Um, once those guidelines are published, if you do have questions, please let me know. Um, we did get one question um, prior to this event today, and that was our students, what are the students going to be doing from the time they move into the residence halls until the first day of class? Um, and are they going to be required to stay on, on campus for that week? So, the residential staff has been very hard at work planning activities, socially distant safe activities for you guys for that week. 
Um, we are hoping to have some take and make craft things that you can do to help take with you and make um, for to help decorate your room. We are going to be doing some outdoor yard games. And we are also going to be working um, to organize some very small group campus tours so you guys can help figure out where your classes are. Um, in regards to going home for that week, please remember that you do have to sign up for a test day. Um, so keep that in mind. But since everything we're doing is in trying to encourage you to be safe and to abide by the university and the government guidelines in regards to COVID, we would encourage you to stay on campus during that week. Um, if you do need to go home for something, we do ask that you abide by the current guidelines and wear a mask um, out in public, you wash and sanitize your hands regularly, and that you maintain a safe social distance. Um, you know, we do want to make sure that we are protecting both your family at home as well as our golden bear, our extended golden bear family. Um, if you do have questions, please refer to our website or give me a, shoot me an email and I will be happy to answer them. Um, so next up, I would like to introduce our Director of Athletics, Kenny Howell. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'll uh, reiterate with uh, President Long that uh, obviously many of these policies and procedures that I'll announce today are true as of this very moment. Uh, we have a myriad of information that, that we are uh, trying to get through related to the national office, our conference, and our opponents. So um, many of the, the policies that we will put in place may not necessarily be the same for those that are from the schools outside of our territory or region. So we're doing our best to try to come up with a policy that, that takes care of most of, of what each individual state may want to put in place for the safety of their student athletes. Um, I can tell you that our start dates have been announced from the national office. Uh, the August 15th start date is that for organized practice. The organized practice cannot take place prior to a testing and screening as far as WVU Tech is concerned. So our student athletes will be part of the normal testing group as well. So we will bring them back to campus a few days early so they can isolate for 72 hours, get their test, and be ready for that August 15th practice start date. Now that August 15th date is for our fall sports practices to commence. No other sports will practice until they're permitted by the national office. Secondly, we will not play intercollegiate competition until September 5 or after. And that also has been mandated by the national office. The, opportunity for our students to get together prior to that will be only for practice or scrimmage competitions that take place within that window after testing. So we will not play anyone outside of our institution until after September 5th. Now I mentioned screening. The, the screening of our student athletes will be a little more rigorous than some of our other institutions in our conference. We will have a checklist and daily screening and temp checks for every student athlete that comes through our practice sessions. This is also for contact trace, but also for the overall health and safety and well being of our students. Uh, the questionnaire has been derived and will be based on a point system. So if a student athlete doesn't feel well, has a temperature, there are immediate signs of an illness, they will be removed from competition immediately. There will be no other contact for that student until they've been tested or they've seen a physician and been released. Um, our testing protocol uh, will be the same as the rest of the institution for our initial COVID-19 tests. Uh, we will ask our fall sports student athletes to try to be at the front of the testing cycle, which will open on August 11th. That is in hopes that we will have results in time for them to begin their practice on the scheduled date around August 15th or August 16th. Our students will then also be required to retest within seven days of the first intercollegiate competition. So our, for our fall sports, most of our fall sports will commence around September 5th, 6th, or 7th. So all of our fall sports students who play outside competition 
that first week will have to retest within seven days per NAIA mandate. Uh, that being said, there are some differences between the testing period coming through now and what may be handed down later, depending on how the virus responds in the next three to four weeks. So we'll keep everyone uh, up to date with that. We are uh, putting all the information that we have available on the Golden Bear Athletics website. Uh, we'd like for you to visit goldenbearathletics.com to see the COVID-19 updates posted by the NAIA. Uh, they have actually issued another post as of July 10, but it is also posted on the Golden Bear Athletics website as of today. So that'll be the first story you see when you go to our athletic webpage. You can also find it at naia.org forward slash COVID-19. Now, as far as our staff and coaches returning to work, our essential employees and administrators have commenced returning this week. Uh, so you, if you're also on campus, you may see myself, uh, Melissa or Garrett, just in preparation for our fall sports to do uh, the clerical work process scholarships and those things. Our fall sports coaches will be allowed to return to work August 3rd. All other coaches and staff will return August 10th. So the return to work has started for us and, and our coaches and staff will begin trickling in. So uh, hopefully you'll see us around campus and we're looking forward to an outstanding year. Uh, with more on the return to work policy, uh, here's our HR partner, Janelle Sewell. Thank you, Kenny, and good morning, Golden Bear family. I'm here today to talk to you about how we are collectively together going to return to on-campus work safely. Jen, next slide, please. Over the following week, some of you have, re have received a letter that went out via email from your supervisor, and it was to give you more insight about the on-campus work playbook. All faculty and staff are expected to fully comply with the policies and procedures and guidelines described in the Return to On-Campus Work Playbook. Failure to follow these safety protocols may result in a counseling or disciplinary action and up to and including termination of employment in accordance with the WVU Board of Governors Talent and Culture Rule 3.8 and Board of Governors Faculty Rule 4.2. Next slide. Now, we have done our best within talent and culture to make sure that we give you the resources available so that this can be a collaborative effort. So what you will find is that when you go to the talent and culture website, there is actually the return to on-campus work playbook for faculty and staff. There are two different versions of this that you can look at. It's the same content in each version, version, but if you are a technology savvy person, then you can use the online version. However, you can also download a printable hard copy version. This version is only 14 pages in length and it's truly an easy read. Some of the things that are going to be covered in this playbook include the following. Workplace expectations and guidelines. Symptoms for monitoring requirements. COVID-19 workplace accommodations and modifications, phased return to campus, work for staff, safety practices and procedures, guidance for specific workplace scenarios, information about mental and emotional well-being, and then of course, guidance for campus visitors. Another thing that we have worked truly hard on within talent and culture over the last few months is making sure that we've worked to prepare checklists for you. So supervisors, we have checklists for returning to on-campus work that you can use with your employees. We also have on-campus work checklists for employees. So supervisors, please utilize this tool. Also, there's guidance for self-quarantining and returning to work. There's additional information about how to self-quarantine for guidance, and then also how to return to work after home isolation. Next slide. So, some of the things that have come up in conversation over the last week is what is remote work? 
A letter that went out last week from supervisors indicated that there are three different scenarios. On campus work, there's remote work, and there's also hybrid work. Remote work has to do with individuals who are solely working from home, and that would be indicated from your supervisor. The hybrid schedule is more of a safer approach that we are trying to utilize. So let me go into further detail. Employees who can work remotely or in a hybrid schedule to fulfill their work duties upon supervisor approval should continue to do so to reduce the number of individuals on campus and the potential spread of COVID-19. Now, what we know is tech is a smaller campus, and that means we need to see everyone doing their best. So please work with your supervisor and make sure that you guys are in collaboration on what works best for your unit. These arrangements should be approved by the employee's immediate supervisor and can be done on a full or partial day work schedule as appropriate or as needed. Next slide. Now, within the letter, you will have received a link. This link is to a telecommuting agreement. On the screen right now, you'll see an example of what this looks like. So you'd have your employee name, your supervisor's name, and then you would be able to look at the position type. Also, you would be able to go through the scrolled list of participants within the university system, and you would click WVU Beckley Campus. You would list your location of where you would currently be working and also the telecommuting location and your main primary business location. Now, I wanna be very clear about this form. This form is only needed if you are working remotely from home or on a hybrid schedule. As you can see, looking at the screen right now, on the bottom right-hand side, it has a start time, an end time, and a location. Please work with your supervisor to make sure you are in agreement and consensus about moving forward with this form. This form should be completed and filled out before your return to work. So please work with your supervisor to make sure that you are receiving the accommodations necessary and that we can provide the optimal service for our students, faculty, and staff. Also, I've received questions about this form and it's in reference to, well, what if I, it varies from day to day, start time or end time because of alternating schedule. There is a comment section at the bottom of the form which you can provide more detail. So just make sure that you're filling this out in agreement with your supervisor and supervisors, if you're wondering where will we get this information and how do we know if it's been filled out correctly. All of the forms that are submitted are a Qualtrics form. And with this Qualtrics form, they will be submitted to the central office in Morgantown, West Virginia, and then routed to the supervisor and the HR partners. So supervisors, I'll be in touch with you if I have not received a form from your employee. Next slide. So you heard me talk about alternating days. They are saying that best practices are to alternate days and also sometimes times in which we enter and exit the building. So to limit the number of individuals and interactions on campus, departments and units may consider scheduling partial staffing on alternating days. These schedules support physical distancing, especially in areas that have large common workspaces. Next slide. Also, you heard me talk about staggered reporting and departing. The beginning and end of the workday typically bring many people together at a common entry and exit points of the campus buildings. Staggering reporting and departure time by at least 30 minutes may reduce traffic in common areas, which support physical distancing and requirements. So for example, if your normal time to come into the office was to clock in by 8.15, your supervisor may be working with you to see if you could come in at 7.45 or 845 during that blocked time. So work together to see how you can get all of your requirements and fulfilled hours throughout the week with your supervisor in a safe manner that practices social distancing. Next slide. We've had several questions about accommodations and modifications. 
Medical conditions that necessitate reasonable accommodations related to COVID-19 are being addressed as the Americans with Disabilities Act accommodations. In accordance with the ADA Amendments Act, certain factors do not meet the definition of a disability. So for example, our age, if someone is pregnant, or if they're caring for a vulnerable family member who may have a pre-existing condition, that doesn't necessarily fall within the ADA Amendments Act. In these cases, employees will need to be referred to West Virginia University Medical Management. Reasonable modifications will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. When applicable, other provisions may run concurrently with accommodations such as FMLA, FFC, RA, leave, and other university programs. So you may be wondering, how do I seek accommodations? Faculty and staff should contact coronavirus modification at mail.wvu.edu if they've been instructed to return to on-campus work and they have the following concerns. If they have a concern due to a medical condition that places them in a higher risk group, if they have members of their household who are also considered higher risk, if they're pregnant, or if they wish to seek ADA accommodations, please visit the following. Visit diversity, the Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion website for more information and to access the COVID-19 modification request form. All of these forms are also linked to the Talent and Culture website. If you have an individual situation that you'd like to discuss and gain more guidance on, please give me a call or email me at jwillia4 at mail.wvu.edu. I look forward to working with all of you. I look forward to seeing you face-to-face -face or via Zoom, and I'm here to serve. So that's all I have for you today, and I'm going to turn it over to Christina Dalton with the Office of Student Accounts. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone. Um, Christina Dalton here. Um, just wanted to uh, provide a little bit of information in relation to our Office of Student Accounts, um, go over some important dates, um, talk a little bit about how our operations will be adjusting and pivoting due to the pandemic. Um, so we will go ahead and get into some important dates for students. Um, so first off, um, students have previously been communicated uh, via email and social media uh, platforms as far as the upcoming fall 2020 uh, payment due date, which is August 1st. Um, I know historically we've had some students um, not be aware of the insurance waiver deadline. Um, so please be mindful of that um, on August 1st as well. Uh, a lot of the questions obviously that we get from a student account standpoint is when uh, students can expect to receive a refund. Um, and for the fall semester, the earliest date possible would be August 14th, um, followed by another important date that students need to be mindful of which is the last day to add and drop classes for fall 2020, which is August 25th. Um, so I want to point out for the upcoming August 1st uh, payment due date, um, please be mindful that there are monthly late fees that are assessed the second of every month. Um, so if you are a student and you are not able to pay your balance in full by August 1st, we have stressed to students um, and recommended that they sign up for the cash net payment plan. Um, for example, if a student would have a $4,000 balance and they enroll in this payment plan by July 31st, um, that $4,000 balance would essentially be split into four monthly payments. Um, so this is a great option if you are a student and unable to pay the full amount by the August 1st deadline we will encourage you to enroll in the cash net payment plan. Um, now, one thing to note for the cash net payment plan that we've seen is that you can only enroll in the payment plan for the fall semester. Um, so we have had some students who have wanted to enroll in the cash net payment plan 
for a prior spring or summer balance. Um, but unfortunately, to be able to enroll in this, this would be for fall balances only. Um, because in theory, if you do have a prior balance, um, then you should be unable to register for the fall semester. So again, if the payment plan is an option for you, um, we encourage you to sign up by July 31st, which will give you essentially more time to pay off your balance and will pretty much avoid um, students being assessed the late fee that happens the second of every month. Um, so one thing to uh, clarify um, from a tuition and fee room and board standpoint is that for the Beckley campus, we did not have a increase in both tuition and fees and room and board. Um, contrast that to the Morgantown campus. Um, they didn't see an increase in tuition and fees, but they did, did have an increase in room and board. So I want to make sure to clarify that, um, at least for the Beckley campus, there were no increases in tuition and fees and room and board. Um, so again, getting back to some of the concerns that we've heard from students um, that hopefully I will be able to address is that, you know, I know there's some students that are going back and forth. Um, unfortunately, they don't know if they'll be able to attend for the fall semester. Um, so if you've already registered, the best option that we would suggest is that you go ahead and either pay your balance in full by August 1st or again, and enroll in the payment plan to avoid the late fees that will be assessed um, on the second of each month. So for international students, we have Flywire that can be utilized. Um, we always uh, communicate to students to please allow two to three weeks um, for your payment to process and post. Um, so you may be thinking we have an August 1st due date coming up. Um, if I utilize Flywire, it'll take two to three weeks to post. However, if you are an international student with a U.S. bank account, um, you can still enroll in the cash net payment plan. And again, that will avoid um, the late fee assessment each month um, and we'll split that balance down into installment payments. Um, so ultimately, um, again, if, if you, if you are a student and you are unable to attend the fall semester um, and have already paid, um, please rest assured that you will receive a full refund um, as long as you fully withdraw by that August 25th uh, due date. So please contact our registrar's office to fully withdraw. Um, and again, we can ensure that you will receive a full refund um, if your circumstances end up being that, unfortunately, you're not able to attend for the fall. So uh, this next slide is mainly for our first-time freshmen, first-time transfer students. Um, pretty much a, a simple uh, uh, process for how to access your fall bill. Um, you simply log into the portal, uh, click view details in the student account box on the right-hand side of the screen click electronic bill by term slash make payment and select a term. Um, and for parents who have been granted proxy access by their student, you can view that information at the link that we've um, included in this PowerPoint presentation. One thing that I would like to note in relation to proxy access is that um, this is associated with FERPA, um, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So how we describe this to students and or parents is that FERPA is similar to HIPAA. Um, HIPAA essentially protects medical records. FERPA essentially um, protects educational records. So we are not allowed to pro provide information to either a parent or a guardian um, if the student has not granted that parent or guardian proxy access. Um, so just wanted to uh, reiterate that because we do have um, questions come in with parents um, and unfortunately there's some information that we are not able to provide to parents and we always have to uh, recommend that they talk with their son or daughter um, to have them grant them proxy access so we can provide that information to them. Uh, a couple of payment methods um, that we do accept while we're on the topic of bills. Uh, we take cash, check, 
uh, money order, obviously the cash net payment plan payments, in addition to the flyer, fly wire payments that our international students utilize to transfer um, us funding to the US bank accounts. So as far as the upcoming fall operations, um, I, would, I will say that other student support areas will be following something similar. Um, so additional information will be forthcoming on this, but as it relates to student account operations uh, for the tuition and fee related payments and questions that we would receive, um, if you are wanting to uh, discuss these, whether it be over the phone, via Zoom, or in person, we will be uh, moving forward with scheduled appointments only. Um, so we will not be accepting walk-up traffic. Um, I know Morgantown is doing um, something similar. So this will begin on the first day of classes, August 19th. Um, we've structured it in a way that it will be in 20 minute increments. And again, the student and or parent will have the option to um, choose whether they want to have these meetings over the phone, via Zoom or in person. Um, I will say that I, I, I feel as though we can better serve students. Um, for example, if, if we schedule a Zoom meeting, we can do a split screen and have the student's account up be able to thoroughly review that student account um, with the student so they can visually see their bills as well. So overall, I think this will be advantageous for us to be able to service students better. Um, and again, in-person appointments will only be for individuals who must pay in person. Um, this will also help us with contact, this will be a method for contact tracing in that we can schedule these appointments and already have the information of who's coming on what day and what time. So this helps out our office in the event that we would um, receive news that someone would test positive. We would just go back to the log book as far as who um, our team members came in contact with um, so we can inform the appropriate personnel. Again, um, from, from this standpoint, we'll have two uh, team members who will be um, essentially uh, tasked with scheduling these appointments via the phone, Zoom, and, um, phone, Zoom, and in person. We'll have a third staff member who will be manning the phone lines, um, and we will have a fourth staff member who will actually be focused on uh, our Tech OSA vanity account and responding to all of those emails that would come in through that method. Um, so our response time, um, the goal would be 24 to 48 hours that the student would either have their issue resolved or at least would receive an acknowledgement from us. Um, internally, my team knows that that's probably more than, more like 24 hours. No pressure, but, um, my team is amazing and I know they'll do a great job at adapting and making sure that we service our students in a timely fashion. So again, there's outside of tuition and fees, we also handle photo IDs and parking permit distribution. So similar to the tuition and fee related questions and concerns, we'll also be doing a similar scheduled appointments only for photo IDs and parking permit distribution. Um, an email went out to students yesterday to their MIX account. So students, if you have not checked your MIX account, please check that. That includes additional information as far as the process and the procedure of this new uh, process with photo IDs. We will not be taking photo IDs in the Office of Student Accounts this fall. Morgantown has rolled out a new process to where both faculty, staff, and students can upload a photo online. Um, obviously, um, with ITS guidelines, for example, no hats, front face. Um, so if you want to, you can visit our website for more info. But again, an email went out to all students yesterday, and we are currently working on getting an email out to faculty and staff, um, which will mainly be our new faculty and staff that will need photo IDs that will actually need to go through this new process. Um, as far as parking permits, those can still be purchased online. 
um, appointments will be in five minute increments and are currently available to reserve. So again, from a contact tracing standpoint, um, we can already know who's coming in the day before. We can pull their parking permits. We can pull their photo IDs, have it handy, know who's coming and know who's coming when in the event that we need to go back to those logs for contact tracing. The appointments for ID and parking permit will also start on the first day of classes. Um, and just to reiterate for those students who are staying in the residence halls, we have coordinated with Student Life and Student Life will be um, handing out uh, the IDs and parking permits for those students who currently reside in the residence halls. Um, so the link for the Sign Up Genius appointments will be forthcoming. Um, and you all will receive more information as far as a uh, landing resource page for all of the student support service areas that will be utilizing the scheduled appointments for the fall semester. Lastly, uh, for those of you who have been with us for the last couple of years, um, you will notice that we've, we being the Office of Student Accounts have had a more online presence within the last couple of years. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns regarding tuition and fees, uh, photo IDs, in addition to parking permits. Um, we have a vanity account. Um, that's manned essentially 24 seven that we respond and have been able to utilize um, a lot of that in relation to students um, simply wanting us simply wanting to send us an email rather than to give us a call, which is great. We love it. Um, you can uh, also reach us at our phone number 304-929-0333. We also created a Facebook page, I believe within the last two years. So for students, if you uh, don't check your MIX account uh, frequently, um, I would advise that you simply go on Facebook, um, like our page, we post very informative information that will keep you updated on topics associated with our office. And lastly, uh, the Tech OSA website, this is where you can find more in-depth information as far as processes and procedures of what we do and how we do it in our office. Um, so at this point, I will turn it back over to President Long that will discuss our upcoming testing dates. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, very much. And thank you to all of the group that has spoken today. As you can see, uh, we have been uh, very, very busy over the last four, five, six months, and uh, everyone has done an excellent job, and lots and lots of hard work has gone on to get us to this point. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the testing. We will do more in depth at our next meeting, uh, because then we will have everything we hope uh, smooth and ready to run. I think what's exciting is Morgantown is doing it now, so any of the problems that they have, we'll know not to do. So we have a little bit of a, uh, a cushion there that we didn't have. But that being said, the dates for our testing is that emails will go out on the August the 3rd for you to sign up for a testing date, time, and location. Those tests will be 11th, 12th, and 13th here on the campus. As we said before, there will be tests that you can walk into, which will be in Van Meter, and then we will have drive-throughs. Uh, we hope that you will uh, make sure that you come at your assigned time. We wanna encourage all of our fall sports student athletes to, to sign up for the first day if possible, because that's very important as we get those tests back. You'll register online, get your appointment, attend at your schedule, and the whole process hopefully will last less than 10 minutes. But of course, just like everything else we're gonna do this year, patience will be important. But we think we can do this quickly. Uh, we were a little concerned about how long it was gonna to take to get the tests back, but right now, uh, after speaking with Morgantown last night, it seems as we're gonna be in pretty good shape, we should have them back in three to four days. So that means that we should have them back 
before we all go to class. So, uh, but again, as I said, next, uh, next meeting, we'll go over the exact way it's all going to happen. So you'll have somewhat of a good idea of how this is going to work. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is there is a couple of questions that I don't think were answered that we need to make sure students know. One of the questions we got was, how can we tell if a course on our schedule is online, flex, or in seat? Well, you can't tell the difference between in seat and flex because flex is going to be partially in seat. So they will have rooms assigned. But any of the scheduled uh, uh, classes that don't have a seat or a room assignment, a room assignment, then that will probably be an online course. But I would suggest that you t contract, contact, excuse me, your uh, advisors and make sure to talk with them and they can help you do that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention real quickly is, you know, we're, we know that the future is a little uncertain of how we're going to move forward exactly and how things change on a dime just like they did last semester. But I know that our faculty are working very hard because quality is as important to us as quantity. We want to make sure that we maintain that stellar reputation we have of being really a wonderfully academic, high quality institution. So besides being able to interact with our students as much as humanly possible under these restrictions, we want to make sure that you also students are getting the best education possible through the wonderful faculty that we have to give it to you. So I want to tell you that we're balancing all of this as we move down this road. I'd like to do a couple of things here before we go on. I'd like to welcome back, first of all, at the end of the week, uh, next week, we will have most of our furlough, if not all of our furloughed employees back. If some of you are on here, thank you. I know that was not easy to appoint, but we really welcome you back and look forward to seeing you. Uh, if you're not, and you know someone that is, tell them how anxious we are to have them all back. I'd also like to say a special thank you to the faculty that were off contract. Uh, there were an awful lot of faculty members that have stepped up to the plate. They have uh, answered students' questions, worked with their chairs, uh, during a time that they're supposed to be on break and they are not being paid. So I really appreciate what they've done. Um, you'll get some special kudos from me about all of that, but I really thank you. And that's just part of being the tech family, I know, but I still appreciate what you did and how you've done it. And needless to say, I appreciate my administrative staff that have worked night and day, and that is not an understatement throughout this whole time to make sure that we're back on campus. So with that being said, let me tell you something that I need to, I need to end on. We're plowing new ground here. I want all of you to think about back about five years ago, you would have never thought we'd be sitting in Beckley. We've done a couple of things at Tech that in many ways nobody else has ever done or they haven't done in a hundred years. Uh, one of them being moving a campus, and we did that and did that exceedingly well. We actually, when we had a train wreck in uh, Montgomery, we actually evacuated a campus and did that well. So this is new territory that we've never done, and we're all going to have to work together. I know there are faculty and there are students that feel very uncomfortable about coming back in person at all. And I respect that. And those are decisions you will have to make. But, and I can't promise anybody that they're gonna be safe or they're not gonna be safe now or even before this ever happened. I can't promise you that you're not gonna trip and fall down the stairs, those things. I know this is so much serious, much more serious in the sense that it is a disease. And we do know that it is contagious. But I want to tell you, I think we've done the very best we could as we've moved along to try to make it as safe as possible within the constraints that we have. I want all of you to know that we would like your suggestions also. As we get back on campus, if you see something you think, hey, you know, maybe we could do this a little better, feel free to let us know that. 
Can we change everything? Can we do all the things? Can we put everybody in a bubble? No. But if there are things that we've missed, because there's no way that we can see everything. And after you've looked at things the same way for so long, sometimes you don't see things that are pretty evident to you. So we need your help and your guidance as we do this. So again, it's still a moving target. I know as Golden Bears, we can do this and do this well. I actually think we can be the example for the state of West Virginia of how to do this. So uh, if you have great concerns, please make sure you reach out to your supervisors, reach out to your advisors, and let us help you work through as best we can. We won't have the answers to everything, and we can't promise you anything as far as making everything work the way you want it to work, because we do have rules and regulations and policies we have to live within. I appreciate each and every one of you. We probably, we will have another meeting, but it may not be next week. It may be the first of the next week. We will send you out an email because I want to be able to give you some real definite answers when we get to that next point about testing, about what the campus will look like and some of those things. So uh, I thank each of you and I hope that each of you will be happy, stay safe and be prepared. We now have our tech masks ready. And so have a wonderful weekend and uh, I look forward to seeing you in Zoom again, but I look forward more to seeing you on campus. Thank you very much and good evening or good morning. Still morning, isn't it? Thank you very much.